Support for this podcast and the following message come from IBM, who is helping create P-TECH Schools, a new education model that prepares students for 21st century careers. Let's put smart to work. Find out how at ibm.com slash P-TECH. Hey, it's Guy here. During this holiday season, we thought it would be a good idea to rebroadcast a show called Just a Little Nicer if you think that, you know, maybe we need a little more compassion in the world. Uh, This one is for you. It's about compassion, its roots, its meaning, and where we go from here. This is the TED Radio Hour. Each week, groundbreaking TED Talks. TED Talks. Um, TED. TED. Technology. Entertainment. Design. Design. Is that really what it stands for? I've never known that... Delivered at TED conferences around the world. It's the gift of the human imagination. We've had to believe in impossible things. The true nature of reality beckons from just beyond. Those talks, those ideas, adapted for radio. From NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, just a little nicer... Ideas about compassion and empathy. And is there any more compassionate place this time of year than cable news? And by the way, in New York, he could have gone you know, the Lion King. He could have seen, seen the Lion King and gotten he he was right. outraged the One of the voices you're hearing here is Sally Cohen. Sally, let's be honest here. When you go to a play, whether you're Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, or Mike Pence, or Donald Trump, you're not expecting... Sally Cohen is... A columnist and a political commentator at CNN. And that means she does this. And Donald Sally, Trump, when you go to a play, funny. though, you don't That's expect funny, that they're going to turn political on you in the audience, it's, Sally. It's let's be clear. Play, when, when he goes there... when he This goes is what Sally does Sally, for a living. Sally, she argues with people on TV about politics. And for that, she gets lots of hate mail. Can you take take like take out your your iPhone or whatever you have there and just I don't know, just read like some of the things that that people have have tweeted at you or emailed to you just like in the past couple days. Uh, let's see here. Just last night, after putting my kid to bed after our Christmas tree decorating party, uh, I got a tweet that said F- you. Huh. Just, that was it. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. You can't really be that dumb. I'm not sure how you were raised. You stupid <laughs> That's a good one. Wow. Uh, that one was spelled correctly. Right. So, yeah. two thumbs up for Brad. Way to go, Brad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, for Brad, for Sally, for all of us. There are more ways than ever to be cruel or mean or nasty. And yet, as we'll hear from TED speakers on the show today, compassion is actually necessary for our health, for a well-functioning society, for our survival, and it's often easier to be compassionate than you might think. It's like, you know, if you have that uncle who you disagree with at the holidays. Yeah, he still loves you. You know, might argue politics, but you still love them, and they love you, and they're still nice, and they care about you. But... You would never say the things to your uncle in person that people say to complete strangers on Twitter. So, you know, then we have to figure out a way to relearn compassion. And that is ultimately being able to appreciate and validate someone else's experience, even if it isn't our own. So even when you get all this stuff, you kind of internalize it and you say, you know what, actually... I think that we can become more compassionate, and I'm and I'm optimistic we're going to get there. You know, like six days out of seven. <laughs> I allow myself sullen Sundays where yeah. I just, uh, you know, you just sit and and mope about the future of humanity. Uh. <laughs> All right, so. Sally's TED Talk is short. It's about four minutes. And she spoke back when she worked as a progressive lesbian political pundit on Fox News. So y'all heard that, right? Just to make sure, right? I'm a gay talking head on Fox News. I'm going to tell you how I do it and the most important thing I've learned. So I go on television. I debate people who literally want to obliterate everything I believe in, in some cases who don't want me and people like me to even exist. The hate mail I get is unbelievable. Last week alone, I got 238 pieces of nasty email. 
and more hate tweets than I can even count. I was called an idiot, a traitor, a scourge, uh, a and an ugly man, and that was just in one email. <laughs> so, what have I realized being on the receiving end of all this ugliness? Well, my biggest takeaway is that for decades, we've been focused on political correctness, but what matters more is emotional correctness. The tone, the feeling, how we say what we say, the respect and compassion we show one another. And what I've realized is that political persuasion doesn't begin with ideas or facts or data. Political persuasion begins with being emotionally correct. So when I first went to go work at Fox News, true confession, I expected there to be uh, marks in the carpet from all the knuckle dragging, right? That, by the way, in case you're paying attention, is not emotionally correct. Um, but, but liberals on my side, uh, we can be self-righteous, we can be condescending, we can be dismissive of anyone who doesn't agree with us. In other words, we can be politically right, but emotionally wrong. And incidentally, that means that people don't like us, right? Now here's the kicker. Conservatives are really nice. I mean, not all of them and not the ones who send me hate mail, but you would be surprised. Sean Hannity is one of the sweetest guys I've ever met. He spends his free time trying to fix up his staff on blind dates, and I know that if I ever had a problem, he would do anything he could to help. Now, I think Sean Hannity is 99% politically wrong, but his emotional correctness is strikingly impressive, and that's why people listen to him because you can't get anyone to agree with you if they don't even listen to you first. It actually sounds really hokey to sort of say it standing up here, but when you try to put it in practice, it's really powerful. I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, an average of like 5.6 times per day, I have to stop myself from responding to all of my hate mail with a flurry of vile profanities. I'm not perfect, um, but what I am is optimistic because I don't just get hate mail. I get a lot of really nice letters, lots of them. And one of my all-time favorites begins, I'm not a big fan of your political leanings or your sometimes tortured logic, <laughs> but I'm a big fan of you as a person. Now, this guy doesn't agree with me, yet, <laughs> but he's listening. Not because of what I said, but because of how I said it. And somehow, even though we've never met, we've managed to form a connection. That's emotional correctness. And that's how we start the conversations that really lead to change. Thank you. So what do you do? Do you, like, when you're with somebody who, who just, whose views you just think are totally, like, reprehensible, you hate everything they say, like, do you think, okay, let me just imagine what the world would be like if I was them? Like, do you, do you actually go through that process in your head? Yeah. Huh. And it, it is, it's, it's, it's almost a meditative practice. You know, when someone, I don't know, pick an issue. They don't want immigration reform because they're worried enough about losing jobs and how the economy is changing in their community and all of that. And, you know, if I think, okay, what emotionally can I connect with? The economic anxiety piece, I can connect with that. And it's not just like, I feel your pain. I get it. I feel it too. I actually understand that feeling. Hmm. If I can start the conversation there with a connection and then say, that's why actually I support immigration reform because X, Y, Z, and P, and Q, I'm not invalidating that other person's experience. I'm not invalidating their emotions, their sense of the world. I'm saying, yeah, you're valid. Look, all we all want to be told is that our feelings are valid. You see, I, I never thought that I would be making this observation, but it, it seems to me that cable news has actually made you more compassionate. <laughs> wow, I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, wow. Gee, right. guys, I have, to, th I have yeah. to think about that for a second. But yes, yeah. no, there's no question that I, um, you know, I've been thinking about this more and more lately. I have a, you know, we all, I guess, have a mean streak. And I've definitely had to learn to temper that. But compassion where it's not compassion for my neighbor or my friend or my relative, but compassion in an anonymous sense is a form of trust and faith and hope. 
It doesn't mean I don't lose faith like with any form of faith. Your faith isn't tried or tested daily. Um, but if I, it's sort of if I didn't believe it were possible, well, then where would I be? That's the political pundit Sally Cohn, who is actually pretty compassionate on TV. She's got two TED Talks. You can find both of them at TED.com. And he's now calling it a train wreck. Oh. Well, look, uh, uh, first well, of all, uh, the, well, the premium. Well, let's address a lot of the things that are in here. Let's address a lot of the things that are in here. The premiums, the CBO. So, uh, Sean Hannity, actually, warm and cuddly guy. It really throws people. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so what I'd like to do this morning is uh, perform a linguistic resurrection. And I hope you'll come with me on my basic premise that words matter, that they shape the way we understand ourselves, the way we interpret the world, and the way we treat others. So what is it, three-dimensionally? Uh, what are its kindred and component parts? What's in its universe of attendant virtues? To start simply, I want to say that compassion is kind. Now, kindness might sound like a very mild word, and it's prone to its own abundant uh, cliché. But kindness is a kind of everyday byproduct of all the great virtues. And it is a most edifying form of instant gratification. Compassion is also curious. Compassion cultivates and practices curiosity. Compassion can be synonymous with empathy. It can be joined with the harder work of forgiveness and reconciliation. But it can also express itself in the simple act of presence. It's linked to practical virtues like generosity and hospitality and just being there, just showing up. I mean, and also what you do, right? Just by listening to people, that, that's an act of compassion. I mean, listening is a hugely powerful form of attention. It's presence. And if you are really listening, you are genuinely curious, and you are open to be surprised and changed by what comes back at you. So, so compassion is not necessarily about agreeing with somebody else. It's not even necessarily about liking them. It is about making a choice to honor their humanity. So I, I know that the way I think about you, you, you personify compassion, right? And you are, you know, just this incredibly understanding and empathetic person all the time. And that you just kind of live these things. So is that right? You know? No, it's not. It's okay, it's not, not all right. right. I mean, I live these things sometimes. I probably spend more time thinking about them. I spend a lot of time in conversation with people who are embodying them. I do my best, you know? I, I do my best, but I'm not I, I, I'm not always able to rise to this. Um, I think what I've gotten better at is uh, forgiving myself for that hmm. and getting up the next day and, and you know, maybe doing it a little bit better. Do you find yourself, like, recalibrating your, your compassion compass, like reminding yourself to think a certain way or, or to do certain things? You know, um, I, I actually think that compassion, that we should treat compassion, learning compassion and becoming more compassionate, like we treat learning to play the piano or learning to throw a ball. Hmm. That it's actually something that we can decide we are going to practice. And so, you know, rather than saying, I have to become this compassionate person so that I can act this way, I actually think this is one of these things where the more we do it, it actually then starts to work on us from the inside. It's something you teach. It, yeah, you teach it. And the, and the more then it becomes instinctive. Just as we are hardwired to, to learn to learn a language, I do absolutely think we're born with this redemptive capacity to be compassionate. Then, again, we have to start to practice it around each other. We have to start to, to embody it in front of our children and in our common life. I do think that that will be infectious. Our culture is obsessed with perfection and with hiding problems. But what a liberating thing to realize that our problems, in fact, are probably our richest sources for rising to this ultimate virtue of compassion, towards bringing compassion towards the suffering and joys of others. Einstein became a humanitarian, not because of his exquisite knowledge of space and time and matter, but because he was a Jew as Germany grew fascist. Compassion can't be reduced to sainthood any more than it could be reduced to pity. So I want to propose a final definition of compassion. And that would be for us to call compassion a spiritual technology. 
Now, our traditions contain vast wisdom about this, and we need them to mine it for us now. But compassion is also equally at home in the secular as in the religious. So I will paraphrase Einstein in closing and say that humanity, the future of humanity, needs this technology as much as it needs all the others that have now connected us and set before us the terrifying and wondrous possibility of actually becoming one human race. Thank you. Krista Tippett, she's the creator and the host of the weekly public radio program on being. You can check out her entire talk at ted.npr.org. So compassion, good idea, we all like it, redemptive capacity, blah, 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 right? I mean, this is not controversial stuff. We all want more compassion around us. So why is something so obviously simple so hard? Science writer Robert Wright says, blame the reptilian part of your brain. You see this all the time. I mean, like road rage, you know, that's road rage. The more you think about it, the stupider it is. But the rage itself, the tendency to become enraged when someone disrespects you is a natural one that made sense in a hunter-gatherer environment. I mean, somebody literally this morning was honking at me as I was driving my children to school just really rudely honking at me. And, and you I, know what they think was unjustified? Whatever it was you did right before they honked, and you're both sure of it. Just just driving slowly. That's what I was doing. Oh, people like you drive me crazy. So that feeling, that is unfortunately a normal part of being a human. But it turns out so is compassion. And there are reasons why our species evolved to be that way. It's an idea Robert explained on the TED stage. The title of his talk is The Evolution of Compassion. So it's not going to sound as warm and fuzzy maybe as your average compassion talk. I want to warn you about that. Um, So in the beginning, there was compassion. And I mean, not just when human beings first showed up, but actually even before that. I think it's probably the case that in the human evolutionary lineage, even before there were homo sapiens, feelings like compassion and love and sympathy had had earned their way kind of into the gene pool. And biologists have a pretty clear idea of how this first happened. Um, It happened through a principle known as kin selection. Um, And the basic idea of of kin selection is that uh, if an animal feels compassion for a close relative, and this compassion leads the animal to help the relative, then in the end, the compassion actually winds up helping the genes underlying the compassion itself. So from a biologist's point of view, compassion is actually a gene's way of helping itself, okay? So I warned you this was not going to be very warm and fuzzy, okay? So that would suggest that compassion is not entirely altruistic, right? It's, it's actually, like, selfish in nature. Well... Anything built into us by natural selection has to ultimately have a kind of self-serving logic, at least self-serving at the at the level of the gene. I don't think that needs to drain the inspirational power out of compassion or anything or make us think any less of it. I think we should be grateful that a, a, a seemingly dog-eat-dog process like natural selection left us with an emotion, compassion, that not only do we naturally deploy beyond our families, but through reflection can actually learn to deploy very widely. But there's still these small moments where our compassion is being tested. And we, I mean, we don't always rise to the occasion. You know, there's an interesting dynamic that you may or may not have noticed, which is when you see a beggar and you're not going to give them money, you really don't want to make eye contact with them. Yes, it's, it happens all the time. Right. And you might ask yourself why that is. And I think the answer is that one thing compassion is designed to do is to get us to not necessarily strictly speaking help people, but be seen as helping them. Hmm. Right. So it seems to be very important to us that our generosity be acknowledged. And it seems to be 
kind of painful to us when we ignore a plea for help and are seen to be doing that. Because remember, in the environment of our evolution, uh, you know, a kind of a hunter-gatherer society, everyone you saw would be someone you were going to be seeing again and again and again. And so to deprive someone help they were asking for was to kind of be asking to pay a price for that down the road if you needed their help or wanted their assistance. Now there's more good news that came along later in, in evolution, a second kind of evolutionary logic. Biologists call that reciprocal altruism, okay? And there the basic idea is that uh, compassion leads you to do good things for people who then will return the favor. Uh, again, you know, I know this is, this is not, not as inspiring a, a notion of compassion as you, 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 you may have uh, heard in the past, but from a biologist's point of view, this reciprocal altruism kind of compassion, it is ultimately self-serving uh, too. It's not that people think that when they feel the compassion. It's not consciously self-serving, but to a biologist, that's the logic. It's, it's, and, and so you wind up most easily extending compassion to friends and allies. I, I'm sure a lot of you... Uh, you know, if a close friend has something really terrible happen to them, you feel really bad. And, but if you read in the newspaper that something really horrible happened to somebody you've never heard of, you know, you can probably live with that, okay? That's just, that's, that's human nature. So it's another, another good news, bad news story. It's good that compassion was extended beyond the family by this kind of evolutionary logic. The bad news is, is this doesn't bring us universal compassion by itself, okay? So there's still work to be done. But I mean, how do we show compassion, you know, when it's hard, like like for somebody that you just hate or is really cruel to you, you know? I mean, it's not easy to be compassionate all the time. No, it's hard because we're designed to think we're being good when we're not. We're designed to convince ourselves that our very selective deployment of compassion is thoroughly justified. The good news is that we have compassion. We believe that it should definitely be channeled toward deserving people. But then the bad news is we define deserving people in a self-serving way, at least by nature. We can overcome this on, on reflection, but we have a tendency to be kind of unconsciously selfish, tribalistic, whatever, in the way we go about deciding who we're going to give our compassion to. You know, it's in a certain sense kind of the challenge humanity has been moving toward like forever. Here we are on the brink of having a global civilization, and yet we're not doing a very good job of it, even though as we've been moving toward this point, the knowledge that should help us do it has been accumulating. We understand the problem. Then what's, what's holding us back? Well, ultimately, it gets back to the fact that natural selection is a process that designs things for purposes of serving self-interest. And what is, in fact, self-serving has changed over time, and yet we're stuck with these brains that were designed in an age where what was self-serving was, was different. When you look at, like, the course of human history and just the forces right, that are propelling us forward. Are you optimistic? I mean, do you think that we're becoming better, more progressive, evolved, compassionate people? Well, the good news is that the logic behind being nice to other people is growing stronger and stronger because technology has made our fates more and more intertwined. And we are designed to be nicer to people if their fate is intertwined with ours. The bad news is we seem not always good at recognizing how intertwined our fates are. But I do think we have something to build on. In principle, all it should take is making it clearer to people, you know, what is in their own interest. Science writer Robert Wright his latest book is The Evolution of God. He's given two TED Talks. You can see both of them at TED.com. Can you uh, introduce yourself, please? I'm Karen Armstrong. 
I'm a historian of religion. Uh, do you ever say ex nun? No, well, not anymore, really, <laughs> but I will do if you want. No, no, it's fine. I was just no. curious, yeah. Karen joined the convent at 17. She was miserable there and a total failure as a nun. Because a nun is nothing but the quality of her prayer. And my prayer was so bad, it was off the charts. So seven years later, she left. And she moved to Oxford to study English literature. And just wanted to be secular and atheist. And I wanted to have nothing to do with religion ever again. And it was as a scholar in the secular world where Karen discovered compassion. Because I was so unhappy in my early years when I first left the convent, I used to be really quite a, an unkind person. Huh. And I developed a very sharp tongue. I learned that in the convent, and I also learned it at the University of Oxford. Someone once said to me, do you realize you never say anything nice about anybody? Wow. But I started to learn about being compassionate actually with my study. And I also found that I was much happier. A few years ago, Karen wrote the book on compassion, literally. It's called 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life. And even though she's the author, Karen admits she can't always practice what she preaches. I have a quick temper. I'm very impatient. I often harbor dark thoughts about people, as we, I think we all do, hmm. because we're selfish beings. And it's, <laughs> it must be hard because you have to be nice when you're talking about compassion, because otherwise, I do. Right? Yes, You're it's like a real, trapped. It, it is. It, I'm, I'm supposed to be Miss Nice all the time. And sometimes I can see friends about to impart some really juicy bits of gossip. <laughs> and then they see me and their face falls and you feel what a party pooper yeah, I am. <laughs> there you are, Miss Compassionate. <laughs> Back in the early 80s, Karen was sent to Jerusalem to help with a documentary on early Christianity. And while she was there, she started to read about Judaism and Islam as well. And she was amazed to discover that at the core of all these religions was compassion. More on that in a moment. Our show today, Just a Little Nicer. I'm Guy Raz, and you're listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. Hey, everyone. Just a quick thanks to two of our sponsors who helped make this podcast possible. First to Doctors Without Borders. Right now, Doctors Without Borders field teams are on the ground in more than 60 countries, providing life-saving medical care to people affected by armed conflict, epidemics, natural and man-made disasters, and exclusion from the healthcare system. As an independent humanitarian organization, Doctors Without Borders goes where others don't to care for those most in need. You can learn more at doctorswithoutborders.ngo. Thanks also to LearnVest. LearnVest is an online financial advice company focused on empowering people nationwide to make smart decisions with their money. If you want to know how to aggressively pay down your student loans, LearnVest can help with that. If you want to know how much you should put aside for savings, they can help with that too. Or how much you should contribute to your retirement account. Yep, that too. LearnVest will create a custom financial plan to answer those questions. Plus, they pair you with a financial planner to help keep you on track. To see a sample plan and get a $50 credit, go to LearnVest.com slash Radio Hour. It's the TED Radio Hour from NPR. I'm Guy Raz. And on the show today, just a little nicer. Ideas about compassion and empathy. So before the break, we heard from Karen Armstrong. She's a former nun who became a religious historian. And as she learned more and more about other faiths, she discovered that they all share a core principle. Here's Karen on the TED stage. For years, I've been feeling frustrated because as a religious historian, I've become acutely aware that of the centrality of compassion in all the major world faiths. Every single one of them has evolved their own version of what's been called the golden rule. Sometimes it comes in a positive version. Always treat all others as you'd like to be treated yourself. And equally important is the negative version. Don't do to others what you would not like them to do to you. Look into your own heart. Discover what it is that gives you pain 
and then refuse under any circumstance whatsoever to inflict that pain on anybody else. And people have found that when they have implemented the golden rule, as Confucius said, all day and every day, you dethrone yourself from the center of your world, put another there, and you transcend yourself. Uh, and it brings you into the presence of what's being called God, Nirvana, Raman, Tao, something that goes beyond what we know in our ego-bound existence. The golden rule sounds so simplistic. It's like like something I'd say to my kids, right? Mm, but it's very difficult. <laughs> well, yeah, when you think about it, I mean, it really is all you need to know about your place yes. in the world. Absolutely. Just ask yourself if this is how you would like to be uh, treated yourself. All day and every day. In England, we have a habit of when we've said some, done something nice for people, of saying, well, that's my good deed for the day. <laughs> and so we could then recur, return to our usual practice of unkindness, bitterness, and, and we've done it. We've got it out of the got way. Out of the way, yes. And that could be evil uh, and cruel. But not all day and every day. And if you did it all day and every day, it, it's all impossible because we fail all the time. Uh, you would transcend yourself. I, I wonder if religion is the source of compassion, or is compassion the source of religion? I think compassion is in us. I think that the various religious traditions have emphasized the role of compassion because it's deeply embedded in the structure of our humanity. It's instinctive. The compassionate ethos developed, you know, not in peaceful groves with people meditating peacefully on a mountaintop, they developed in societies like our own, where violence had reached an unprecedented crescendo. And many of them, the Chinese sages in particular, said, unless now we treat each other as we would wish to be treated, human beings will destroy one another. And that has never been more true than today, thanks to the weapons that we've created. Yeah, I mean, if compassion is the core of all the world's religions, as you write and argue... Why do they seem so divisive? Uh, because people don't, a lot of people just don't want to be compassionate. They'd mm. rather be right. And people use their religions to make them, instead of surrendering the ego, to enhance their identity. We are living in a world where religion has been hijacked where terrorists cite Quranic verses to justify their atrocities, where instead of uh, taking Jesus' words, uh, love your enemies, don't judge others, we have the spectacle of Christians endlessly judging other people, endlessly uh, using scripture as, as a way of arguing with other people, putting other people down. Throughout the ages, religion has uh, been used to oppress others, and this is because of human ego, human greed. We have a talent as a, as a species for messing up wonderful things. So the traditions also insisted and this is an important point, I think, that you could not and must not confine your compassion to your own group, your own uh, nation, your own co-religionists, your own fellow countrymen. You must have what one of the Chinese sages called Ryan Ai, concern for everybody. Love your enemies, honor the stranger. We formed you, says the Quran, into tribes and nations so that you may know one another. And this, again, this universal outreach is getting subdued in the strident use of religion, abuse of religion, for nefarious gains. Now, I've lost count of the number of taxi drivers who, when I say to them what I do for a living, inform me that religion has been the cause of all the major world wars in history. Wrong. The cause of our present woes are political. But, make no mistake about it, religion is a kind of fault line. And when a conflict gets ingrained in a region, uh, religion can get sucked in and become part of the problem. 
So if it's part of the problem, I mean, how do people, like religious people, secular, whoever, how do we fix it? Well, that's why I wrote my 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life. Fair enough. People kept asking me, how do we do this? This is all too enormous for me. I can't cope with it. And I, I was very much struck by uh, the Alcoholics Anonymous program yeah. with its 12 steps because we're addicted to our pet hatreds. Uh, we don't know quite what we'd do without the people we dislike. We meditate on their bad qualities and uh, they become almost our alter egos, uh, everything that we are not. We define ourselves in this way. And when we say something unpleasant about somebody, we can get a sort of horrible buzz of pleasure, rather like the first drink of the evening. So we have to wean ourselves away from our addictions to uh, annoyance and having pet grudges and hatreds. But it's a project for a lifetime. That's Karen Armstrong. She's a religious historian and the winner of the 2008 TED Prize. After winning the prize, she launched the Charter for Compassion. If you want to find out more about it or watch her two TED Talks, go to TED.com. Okay, so we've covered empathy in the religious world, the evolutionary reasons for compassion. Let's get a psychologist on the case. Okay. I'm ready. This is Daniel Goleman. I'm best known to most people as the author of Emotional Intelligence. He pretty much coined that phrase. It's essentially the ability to evaluate another person's emotions. And Daniel's spent his entire career thinking about empathy. And you could say it's had quite the effect on him. You know, I don't pass people up on the street who are panhandling. I stop and give them something. Every time? Pretty much every time, yeah. Wow. And, you know, sometimes uh, you can be skeptical and say, well, you know, this guy's just scamming. He's just trying to get some money for a drink. On the other hand, it's not really about what that person is going to do so much as what it evokes in us and whether we pay attention we tune in, we empathize, we see a need, and we help it. Okay, he might seem like an exception. I mean, most people would probably just walk right by a homeless person without even looking at them. And that's what Daniel's interested in, why we aren't more compassionate. Here he is on the TED stage. There was a, a very important study done a while ago at uh, Princeton Theological Seminary that speaks to why it is that when all of us have so many opportunities to help, we, we do sometimes and we don't other times. A group of divinity students at the Princeton Theological Seminary were told that they were going to um, give a practice sermon and they were each given a sermon topic. Half of those students were given as a topic the parable of the Good Samaritan, the man who stopped to help the stranger in need by the side of the road. Half were given random Bible topics. Then one by one, they're told they had to go to another building and give their sermon. As they went from the first building to the second, each of them passed a man who was bent over and moaning, clearly in need. The question is, did they stop to help? The more interesting question is, did it matter they were contemplating the parable of the Good Samaritan? Answer, no, not at all. What turned out to determine whether someone would stop and help a stranger in need was how much of a hurry they thought they were in. Did they, were, were they feeling they were late? You would think that they would be the most compassionate, that they would all have stopped. And I think divinity students would think that they would yeah, stop. Right? Yeah, they're divinity students. <laughs> but, you know, there's two major systems in the mind. One is the system that's in awareness, where we have a view of ourselves that is our ideal self. And then there's another system that runs us much of the time, or too much of the time, where we're on automatic. And factors like time pressure uh, rule us when we're on automatic. You have to be mindful. Being mindful means paying attention to what's your what's going on in your own stream of thought, in your own stream of feelings, and around you. Mindfulness is a general way of preparing yourself to be compassionate hmm. when the opportunity arises. Like, what is our brain telling us to do or to be when we're behaving in a, in a compassionate or, or in an empathetic way? 
Well, one of the first things that the science tells us is that there are different kinds of empathy and they don't all lead to compassion. One of them is cognitive empathy. That's understanding how the other person thinks about things, taking their perspective. This helps you communicate very well with people. It doesn't make you more compassionate necessarily. You could say Bernie Madoff was probably very good at cognitive empathy. He knew how to hustle people. The second kind is... Um, emotional empathy, where you feel immediately what the other person feels. And this can help you be very close, to have chemistry with the person. It's a basis of rapport. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. The third kind of empathy is called empathic concern. It means, I know how you feel, I know what you need, but I'm predisposed to help you if I can. It's the caring system of the brain. That's the core of empathy. There's a new field in brain science, social neuroscience, that studies the circuitry in two people's brains that activates while they interact. And the new thinking about compassion from social neuroscience is that our default wiring is to help. That is to say, if we attend to the other person, we automatically empathize, we automatically feel with them. They're, these newly identified neurons, mirror neurons, that act like a neural Wi-Fi, activating in our brain exactly the areas activated in theirs. We feel with automatically. And if that person is in need, if that person is suffering, we're automatically prepared to help. At least that's the argument. But then the question is, why don't we? And I think this speaks to a spectrum that goes from complete self-absorption to noticing, to empathy, and to compassion. And the simple fact is, if we are focused on ourselves, if we're preoccupied, as we so often are throughout the day, we don't really fully notice the other. Okay, so people are so much less compassionate when they don't speak to you face-to-face, -face, right? Mm -hmm. When they communicate digitally, like, um, like the kinds of things people write to Sally Cohn. There's a whole generation of people growing up right now who have always communicated like that, which must worry you, right? Absolutely. And my worry is this. The way in which uh, humans have transferred skills in emotional intelligence and in managing ourselves and in our relationships uh, is through face-to-face -face interaction, which means that this skill set is not being learned the way it has been in, in past generations. And to the extent that we're communicating, say, by texting rather than face-to-face, -face, we are uh, communicating where there's no channel for the social brain. You're being deprived, you're being starved of vital information. I mean, the consequences of that are, are potentially huge. It's an unprecedented experiment with an entire generation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you could imagine that it would be very hard to create a more compassionate world if people just, like, stop communicating in the way that we've been communicating since we, we evolved into this form of species. One of the more interesting experiments going on is with what are called kindness curricula, and they just help kids understand the importance of wishing the people in your life to be well, that they should be happy, healthy. Uh, and so on. And it turns out that that activates the caring centers of the brain, and you become more likely to be the person who does pay attention, attune, empathize, and care. Some time ago, when I was working for the New York Times, it was in the 80s, I did an article on what was then a new problem in New York. It was homeless people on the streets. And I spent a couple of weeks going around with a social work agency that ministered to the homeless. What it did was to shake me out of the urban trance where when we see, when we're passing someone who's homeless in the periphery of our vision, it stays on the periphery. We don't notice and therefore we don't act. One day soon after that, it was a Friday, um, at the end of the day, I went, was going down to the subway. It was rush hour, and thousands of people were streaming down the stairs. And all of a sudden, as I was going down the stairs, I noticed that there was a man slumped to the side, shirtless, not moving, and people were just stepping over him, hundreds and hundreds of people. And because my urban trance had been somehow weakened, I 
found myself stopping to find out what was wrong. The moment I stopped, half a dozen other people immediately ringed the same guy. And we found out that he was Hispanic, he didn't speak any English, he had no money, he'd been wandering the streets for days, starving, and he'd fainted from hunger. Immediately, someone went to get orange juice, someone brought a hot dog, someone brought a subway cop. This guy was back on his feet immediately. But all it took was that simple act of noticing. And so I'm optimistic. Thank you very much. Psychologist Daniel Goleman, he's writing a book right now. It's all about compassion. Watch his full talk at ted.npr.org. Be nicer to me. Hey, thanks for listening to our show on compassion this week. Our production staff at NPR includes Jeff Rogers, Brent Bachman, Megan Kane, Sanaz Meshkanpour, and Bridget McCarthy, with help from Amanda Honigfort, Daniel Shukin, Portia Robertson Migas, and Eric Newsom. Our partners at TED are Chris Anderson, June Cohen, Darren Triff, and Janet Lee. I'm Guy Raz, and you've been listening to the TED Radio Hour from NPR. As the end of the year approaches, some of you have been asking about the best way to show support for the TED Radio Hour. So first of all, thank you for asking. And this is pretty simple stuff. You go to this website. It's stations.npr.org. You find your local station, and you make a year-end contribution. Or, Or even better, become a regular monthly donor. And when you do, please tell them the TED Radio Hour sent you. You can find your local station at stations.npr.org. It'll take like two minutes. It's all tax deductible. And please do tell them TED Radio Hour sent you. Again, that's stations.npr.org. And thanks. Thanks for listening to this podcast. Discover the rest of the NPR podcast.